you to turn to Revelation chapter 12 this morning. You know, most uh, Christmas messages that I've ever heard focus on Jesus is coming to earth as the light of the world. And of course, the only reason the world needs light is because the world is a very dark place. There's a lot of darkness. In fact, the prophet Isaiah when he predicts the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, you know, that wonderful verse, his name shall be called wonderful count. Well, that's like verse, I think, uh, six and seven of Isaiah nine. But the first couple of verses of Isaiah nine tell us that the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, Upon them half the light shined. The dark side of the Christmas story is apparent if you look for it. The fact that Mary was very likely an unmarried teenager and pregnant, of course, under what appeared to be scandalous conditions. I'm sure she faced ridicule for telling the story that an angel told her that her baby that was conceived in her womb was the result of the creative power of God. Also, as we read in Matthew chapter 2, there's a horrible massacre of babies because Herod, the king of Judea, he was intimidated. He felt threatened by the prophecy of the king of the Jews being born in Bethlehem. And so he ordered the death of all male babies two years and under in the region of Bethlehem. Well, this is just a couple incidences. There's much more that could be said about the dark side of Christmas. But I wanted you to understand that it's a very real thing. And I don't think that it is any more apparent than in Revelation chapter 12, which may be surprising to us that we would go there. But it's not surprising when you recognize that the sin and the darkness in our visible world is actually the result of very real darkness in the unseen realm. There is demonic forces, satanic uh, powers that are always the ones that are really behind the darkness that we see in people's lives and in our world. And so that's why I've had you turn to Revelation chapter 12, because here you get a glimpse. It's like God pulls the curtain back and gives you a glimpse of the darkness that is behind everything that appears in our world, the darkness behind it are powers of darkness, evil powers. It says in verse 1 that there appeared a great wonder in heaven, or sign. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. There appeared another wonder or, or sign in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. That's an amazing picture. There's darkness, though, in this picture. And I want to share some thoughts with you from this that I think will be 
pertinent. I think they will be something that will not only stir up our thinking, but will touch our hearts. That's our desire. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that we can be here today. And thank you for the scripture that you have led us to. We thank you for the light that Jesus is. He is that light that shines in the darkness. And Lord, we thank you that you sent him the light of the world. Lord, you have called us, your people, to be the light of the world. Because as we've already had mentioned this morning, the light himself, Jesus, is in us. And so we pray that the light that is in us through Christ would shine forth from us as we navigate through this dark time that we're living in. These are dark days, and yet your bright light abides in us. We pray for you to just have your way in each one of our hearts. Lord, uh, if there be anyone who has never had the darkness removed from their heart, who has never been saved from sin, may this be the day in which they would be trusting you. And may that light shine into the darkness, into the darkness of their hearts, and give them new life, new birth. In Jesus' name, for his glory, we ask it. Amen. So what is this picture here in these first five verses of Revelation chapter 12? And what in the world does it have to do with Christmas? You may be asking. Well, there are several things that I want to show you this morning from, this, from these verses. The first is this. What is pictured here is very obviously a birth, right? Some, something or someone's being born. We have a woman in labor. We have a woman that uh, it brings forth a man, child. We're told in verse number five. And so that's the first thing I want to point out to you today. In Revelation 12, the first five verses, there's a birth. In fact, it says in that uh, first verse, that it was a great sign, it, uh, a great wonder, or a great sign in heaven appeared. You remember, I'm sure you do, that as we read in Matthew chapter 2, that there were probably more than three. Uh, we say the three wise men because they, they presented three different gifts. There might have been more than three, or there might have been just two. I don't know, but... They're called the Magi, right? They followed what? They followed a star. There was something in the sky, some great wonder, some sign in the heavens, something that uh, astronomers uh, would uh, have their attention uh, brought to. And perhaps that great wonder in heaven that is mentioned in the first verse. And I'm not saying for sure, potentially, possibly, that could be a reference to some astronomical phenomenon that uh, would have awakened and led men, like we would call the wise men or the magi. Don't know, but that certainly is a possibility because there's something significant, something great, something big that is happening, and that's why it is a great wonder in the heaven. Well, what's the explanation of what's going on here? It's a birth, but let me further give an explanation about this birth, because the scene uh, can only, I think, really be understood by connecting it with an ancient teenager's dream. We talked already about a dream this morning, right? Brother Craig mentioned the, a couple of dreams. Uh, we read in Matthew 2, Joseph had dreamed. Well, there was a young 17-year-old boy that had an amazing dream. And if you want to turn with me 
keep a, a mark there in Revelation 12, but I'm turning back to Genesis chapter 37. Remember Joseph? He was just a teenager and he had dreams. In fact, uh, he was called the dreamer, but his dreams had great meaning. In fact, he shared his dreams with his 11 brothers, and because of that, they envied him, and they hated him, we're told in verse 8 of Genesis 37. But he dreamed another dream in verse 9, and here it is. He told it to his brother, or his brethren. He said, I've dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me, bowed down before me. Verse 10, and this teenager Joseph, he told the dream also to his father, as well as to his brothers. And his father rebuked him for it. It says in verse 10, his, his father said, what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee? To the earth. So in verse 10, Jacob actually, he actually interprets the dream that his son Joseph had, and he interprets it in this way. The son is a reference to Jacob himself, Joseph's father. And the moon is a reference to Jacob's wife, Joseph's mother, Rachel. And the 11 stars are a reference to Joseph's 11 brothers, the sons of Jacob, which eventually became the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel, or the nation of Israel, if you will. So with that background in mind, with that interpretation given to us, go back to Revelation chapter 12 with me a moment. And I want you to recognize what is pictured here in this first verse is simply that. The woman, the woman that is with child in verse 2, the woman that is in labor, that is travailing in birth, the woman that has labor pains and she's about to deliver a child, that woman is the nation of Israel. That's, the, that's what's pictured here for us. And in fact, I want you also to know that that's not only the explanation, but in the explanation, there's also persecution that is involved here. Because there is another sign in heaven, another wonder appeared in heaven, verse 3. Behold, a great red dragon. Now, if there's any wonder who that is, verse 9, he's identified for us in Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. Okay, so we know who the great dragon mentioned here in verse 3 is, and verse uh, 4 tells us that this great dragon, Satan, the devil, look at it, stood before the woman, that's the nation of Israel, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. So we know who this man child is. Because in Psalm chapter 2 and uh, verses 8 and 9, the promise of the Father, the Father says to the Son, Jesus, Thou art my Son, today have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. And thou shalt rule, th th thou shalt break them to pieces with a rod of iron and shatter them as pottery. So we know who this man-child is that has the rod of iron. It is Messiah Jesus. And it's all happening at his birth. 
And the picture here is that the woman that represents the nation of Israel feels agonizing labor pains because Israel is being persecuted even prior to the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. And it is Israel that brings forth the man-child. It's the nation of Israel that births the Messiah that is mentioned in the first part of verse 5. And so that's the birth that is pictured here in the first five verses. It's the first Christmas, you might say. It's the, it's the birth of Jesus the Messiah. And at his birth, there was a battle. Now we know that there was a battle at the cross. <laughs> we know that uh, he fought and he did spiritual battle and warfare throughout his earthly life, especially the three and a half years of his ministry. But there was a battle at his birth that's pictured here in the third and fourth verse. By the second sign that appears in the heaven, that there is, and, and the literal description of this great red dragon is that he was a large, fiery, or flame-colored dragon that had kingly power. And what we have pictured is really a supernatural conflict. It's happening in the unseen realm, but it takes place also in the physical world. There's a battle going on. There's a supernatural conflict, and it's a conflict between good and evil. It's between God and the good hosts of heaven, and between Satan and the evil hosts of heaven. Paul describes them for us, these evil spirits, these evil heavenly hosts. He describes them for us in different uh, words. He calls them principalities and powers. He calls them mights and dominions. He calls them the rulers of the darkness. Isn't that interesting? The dark side, we're talking about the birth of Christ. The rulers of the darkness of this world Spiritual wickedness, he calls them, in the heavenlies, in high places. These are all terms of Satan and these evil heavenly hosts that do his bidding. They are perhaps the ones that are referred to in the fourth verse as uh, the tail of the dragon, Satan, drawing a third part of the stars of heaven, that is the heavenly hosts to be part and parcel with him and his dark kingdom. Which leads me to say this. The battle is about dominion. The battle is about who is going to be in charge. Who's going to be sovereign in this universe? Who is going to have domain over everything? And this is an ancient battle. This is an ancient conflict. There are two kingdoms that are in existence. And, uh, and they exist invisible. They, in, they exist in this unseen realm. There is the kingdom of darkness and there is the kingdom of light. There is the kingdom of Satan and his heavenly hosts, which are evil. And there is the kingdom of Messiah and his heavenly hosts, which are good, which are holy. It's a battle for domain. Remember, Jesus didn't uh, question the fact that when he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he was offered by Satan all the kingdoms of this world because Satan is, as Paul says, the God, small g, the God of this world. He's the prince of darkness. He's the God of this world. And he is all about having domain. He wants domain. He wants dominion over this earth. He wants dominion over all creation. He wants dominion in your heart and in your life. 
It's all about domain. They're fighting. There's, there's a conflict, a battle. And it's going to end in destruction. One of these kingdoms are going to be destroyed. Satan wants to destroy the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Messiah, and God says that he will, in the end, destroy the kingdom of the wicked one. And so, if we wonder, why is this dragon and his evil heavenly host seeking to devour that child, the Messiah, the moment he's born? is because they want to destroy, they want to stop the Jewish Messiah from being birthed because they want to expand their dominion. They don't want his dominion to be expanded. They want to expand their own dominion. And if you wonder why the Jewish people have always been so hated and so attacked and why there is such a thing, even in ancient times, such as what we call today anti-Semitism, is because Satan wants to destroy the Jewish people. Why? Simply for this reason. They are the ones through which God chose to bring the Messiah, the one who represents the kingdom of God. And at his second coming, at the second coming of Messiah, the prophets tell us that he, Messiah Jesus, when he returns the second time, Revelation 19, he will destroy all the rebellious nations of this earth. And he will also destroy Satan. And by his redemption, he will reclaim all the nations that he disinherited at the Tower of Babel. And he will fulfill what the Father promised him in Psalm 2 and verse 8. Ask of me, and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. The uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. And when he sent his disciples out just before his ascension, he said, go into all the world, and, and I'll empower you to take the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth. That is an allusion to Psalm 2.8. Ask, and I'll give you the uttermost part of the earth for your possession. It's interesting. The result of this rebellion and this battle at the birth of Messiah is that Satan and his evil heavenly hosts were cast out of heaven to earth. This happened before Messiah's birth. That happened in the past. And I'm not going to go there, but I did want to at least uh, mention that in verses 7 to 9, there's another battle. And this is at the end. This is at the end, just before the second coming. This was just before the first coming. At the end, just before the second coming, there's a second battle in heaven. And it's like Satan says, all right, uh, he, Jesus, ascended. He's, uh, I don't have access to him. I've been... He's going to try once again to attack, and there's going to be a battle in the heavens. The Bible tells us in verses 7 and 9, which I'm not looking at today. So, there's a birth. There's a battle. But the third thing, and the most important thing, is there's a breakthrough. Look at verse 5 with me again. Yes, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child, this is Messiah Jesus. Are you with me? Trying to make it uh, interesting and as simple as I can. This to me is very intriguing. This is amazing. This is all part of God's Remarkable plan. We'd never figure it out. You know what? He pulled the wool over these evil spirits in Satan's eyes. They didn't understand what was going on until it was too late. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I'm not sure if it's verse 6 or 8 in that area, it says something like this. If these evil spirits, if these world rulers would have known 
the plan of God, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. He's completely deceived them until they had, uh, it was too late. But what happened is, and uh, what happens in verse five is you have the birth of Messiah Jesus in the first half of the verse. And in the second uh, the half of the verse, you have him being caught up into heaven. So it goes from his birth to his ascension. <laughs> There's nothing of his earthly life in that verse because it doesn't serve the purpose. The purpose here is just to tell us, look, Satan is doing battle. But guess what? He didn't devour the child. Oh, yes, he had a hand in crucifying the Lord of glory, but that was a checkmate. He didn't even realize he was stepping into a checkmate. Because what happened is, as a result of the crucifixion, there's a resurrection. And death and sin and Satan and hell are all defeated. And it is totally totally confirmed in that after the resurrection, there was an ascension. You know what that ascension means? That means he's on the throne. That means he's not only a resurrected Christ, he is an enthroned Christ. He's seated on the throne. He is the sovereign of all the universe. And everything that he said is going to take place because everything he has said that has happened has happened and everything that will happen will happen. There is a breakthrough in that ascension that the Messiah Jesus is snatched away to heaven and that frustrates Satan's attempt to devour him since the Messiah now is inaccessible to Satan because he can't, he's been kicked out of the heavens. And so Satan redirects his hostility to attack the woman who birthed the Messiah. And that woman, remember, is the nation of Israel. And that's current events. That's what's happening today. He's still attacking the woman. And when you read the rest of chapter 12, he attacks the woman until Jesus, the Messiah, returns again to finally rescue her. There's going to be a tremendous attack of the great red dragon on the nation of Israel during a time that Jeremiah calls Jacob's trouble. An unprecedented time. Jesus said, there's never been suffering in Israel like is going to happen during that, that, uh, that three and a half year period, the end of that 70th week of Daniel, the last half of it. But there's been a breakthrough. It's not over. He's risen and he's ascended. And because he is now the enthroned Christ, he has acquisition. The ascension gives him acquisition. By that I mean he acquires all the nations. And he's going to claim them one day. When he returns, he's going to claim his acquisition. He's going to claim all the nations of this earth. He's going to bring back all those nations that he disinherited at the Tower of Babel. He's going to claim them as his own. He's going to claim all creation. I mean, the whole creation, we're told in Romans 8, is groaning and travailing like, like this nation of Israel uh, to give birth, to be restored until now. But when Jesus comes back, creation is going to be released and is going to be freed and is going to be renewed. There's going to be a new heaven. There's going to be new earth. It's all his acquisition. And the implication that I want to leave you with this morning is this. He's going to regain, he's going to acquire all the nations and all creation. Well, nations are made up of individuals. And creation includes not only all human beings. It includes other parts too, but it includes human beings. And human beings includes individuals like you and like me. So ultimately, here's what I want to leave you with. You belong to him. He owns you. He's acquired you. You're his acquisition. 
In fact, the Bible says that if you're a child of God, you're his special treasure. You're his unique possession. There's nothing else that he treasures more than you if you're a child of God. But if you're not born again, if you've never been saved, you still belong to him. He made you. You're his creature. You're, you're, the, you're, you're the working of his hands. You belong to him. And because we all belong to him, every human being is accountable to him. And the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms, every human being is going to one day stand before God as an individual and give a personal account to God of themselves. Does that strike fear in your heart or is that comforting to you? It depends upon your relationship. Do you have a relationship with God? And if you do, is it a right relationship? Because you belong to him and you and I are accountable to him. And you will give an account as a result of that. And that's why it's necessary that if you haven't ever done this, you need to give up and surrender to God today. You know what salvation is? I can put it very simply. Salvation is just taking a white flag, putting your hands in the air with the white flag, and coming to Jesus and saying, I give up. I'm done fighting you. It's a losing battle anyway, so surrender. If you've never been saved, if you are trusting anything other than Jesus work on your behalf on that cross, you're not saved. You're still fighting him. Put up the white flag of surrender today and give it up. You're fighting a losing battle, so surrender. If you're a believer, you can still fight the will of God for your life. You can still go about and selfishly do your own thing. Be what you want to be, go where you want to go, say what you want to say, live the way you want. You need to surrender because you belong to him and you're going to give an account to him as a believer. The Bible says that believers will all stand before what is called the judgment seat of Christ. And he will, at that point, judge us for how we have lived our lives as believers. And we will either suffer loss or gain reward based upon that. So believers need to surrender. If you haven't done that, it's time. It's long past due. It's time because you know what? We're almost in 2024. And maybe you've Maybe you thought you were going to surrender to the Lord last year. How long are you going to hold out on him? And how long will you have anyway? It's time to surrender to the Lord. It's time to recognize that he is the one that is over all. He, he's acquired you. You belong to him. You're accountable to him. So why not just voluntarily recognize that and crown him Lord of all of your life. Crown Jesus Lord of all. How old are you? How many years are you going to fight? How many years is it going to take yet to you, to you surrender? Do you have any years left? Recognize and crown Jesus Lord of all. That takes the work of the Holy Spirit in a life. No man can call Jesus Lord without the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says. You can't just do that on your own. The Father said, if you'll ask me, I'll give you Holy Spirit ability. So ask the Lord to give you the ability to surrender. Someone asked me, what if I don't feel like surrendering to the Lord? But I'm, I'm concerned about that. I don't want to feel that way. I said, well... Do what I heard someone, I read someone told another person in that same condition. Ask the Lord to give you a desire to surrender. Make you willing to surrender to him. That's a good starting place, I think. The Holy Spirit can do that in your life. 
And then whatever you ask in his will, and I think it's his will for you to surrender, don't you? Whatever you ask according to his will, he does it. He hears it and he accomplishes it. So he'll do it. When you respond to Jesus and you make him your Savior and Lord, you at that moment are instantly transferred from Satan's dark kingdom into the kingdom of light. Has God's light been turned on in your heart? You know, regardless of how good you may feel about yourself, if you're honest, there's a dark side in you. There's a darkness within every heart. It's sin. And God's the only one that can truly deal with that darkness within us. One of the favorite and famous Christmas carols that we sing is, O Little Town of Bethlehem. The last verse of that Christmas carol goes like this. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Other words in that song say, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. If you haven't, why don't you invite him to enter in? Why don't you make room for Jesus in your heart? in your life? Why don't you ask him to, to cast out and, and cleanse the sin, the darkness out of your heart? Why don't you receive Jesus and, and take him if you have it? And if you have, why don't you just give it up all to him and stop making excuses and, and procrastinating and putting it off till later because that day never comes. You either do it now or it never happens. As they say, tomorrow never comes. Because when tomorrow comes, it's today. So it's now or never.